Hello, my name is Ai Cheng, Vice President of the Chinese American Heritage Foundation. Chinese American Heritage Foundation promotes the recognition, appreciation, and celebration of historical contributions made to the United States by citizens of Chinese heritage. You are welcome to visit our website, cahf.us forward slash AAPI Talks for information and upcoming events. During this webinar, please use the Zoom Q&A function to ask your questions and we will read your questions during the Q&A period. Our warmest welcome, everyone, joining us on day 19 of our 31 webinars celebrating AAPI Heritage Month. And now it is my honor and pleasure to introduce to you our guest speaker, Mr. Robert S. Wells, author of Voices from the Bottom of the South China Sea. Mr. Wells retired from the US Navy as a captain with a distinguished 30 year naval service career, which included command to the Aegis cruiser USS Lake Champlain during Operation Enduring Freedom in the aftermath of 9-11. During his career, Captain Wells was awarded 20 service medals. His most recent White House experience included three years on the Vice President Dick Cheney's National Security Affairs staff as Special Advisor. And now, without further ado, here is Mr. Robert Wells. Welcome, Captain Bob. It's all yours. Well, thank you very much, Ken, and thank you very much for that uh, very warm welcome and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, I'm the captain tonight, and I'm looking forward to taking you on a, a very special voyage through history and really in honor of the Chinese American Heritage Foundation. Tell you a little bit about the voyage across the Pacific from Guangdong Province to the San Francisco area and California uh, from 1868 to 1875. Now, hopefully, if everything goes well, I will share the screen and be able to give you a few pictures that show this extraordinary story. So thanks again to the Chinese American Heritage Foundation uh, the story, this discussion this evening is a history of Chinese Pacific crossings from 1868 to 1875, as told from my book, uh, Voices from the Bottom of the South China Sea. I'm the author. It's a, it's a book that took uh, four and a half years of research. And uh, during the q and I'll be able to answer any questions with regard to the research, since that's very, very important to accurately portray this history. The story starts in San Francisco, and I'm sure many in the audience this evening know about San Francisco and know it's a great seaport. And it was a fundamental port, a destination for this important Chinese migration that took, that took place from Guangdong in the uh, 1868 to 1875 period. Many people, I, I, pre I presented the Voices story to 17 cities, over 50 presentations, and this is new history. And one of the key reasons it's new history, after almost four and a half years of research to piece it together, is because of the earthquake in San Francisco in 1906. The earthquake, which was 7.6 on the Richter scale, destroyed San Francisco and caused great damage through fire and ruin. And the Pacific Mail Steamship Company, which you can see in the center of this slide, was the company responsible for the Trans-Pacific Passage of upwards of 50,000 Chinese immigrants that came from Guangdong through Hong Kong. So if you wonder why you've never heard about this story, it's because of that earthquake because the records were destroyed. And through research, I was able to piece it all together and tell this very important history, this very important story. 
The story starts right after, uh, toward the end of the American Civil War, approximately six weeks before Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, he approved the congressional bill to build the largest steamers in the world to provide steamship service between San Francisco and China. And you can see the picture on the Harper's Weekly there that shows the size of these huge wooden vessels that were gonna be side wheel steamers to transport people, commerce, as well as treasure from San Francisco to Hong Kong to support commerce with Guangdong province and China. The picture of the ship here was one of the first of the four large steamers is the Great Republic. The Great Republic was joined by three other ships of similar size, the China, the Japan, and the America. These four ships were the largest steamers in the world. And they provided an opportunity for upwards of 1,200 Chinese immigrants per voyage to go from Hong Kong to San Francisco. This will be our steamship for this evening's voyage and I'm your captain, so welcome aboard. And as you can see, they're beautiful ships. This is the Pacific Mail Steamship Japan at Anchorage in Hong Kong Harbor. You can see uh, Victoria Peak behind. And if you could see the smokestack, if you go to the right of the smokestack on the screen and look at the main deck and then think about six decks below, that's where all the third class steerage immigrant passengers paid 45 to $50 in gold to have a berth. So they were able to transit the Pacific to San Francisco. Aft of the steamship by steam the uh, smokestack by the uh, red side wheel that you see there with the lifeboats, that's where the first class passengers were. So you had the merchants from Guangzhou and you also had the women that uh, came across both married women to the merchants as well as uh, women that were coming to San Francisco. Uh, this is where they had their state rooms and their, their spending arrangements for the transit passage across the Pacific. These ships are about 400 feet long, about 50 feet wide, and the actual depth below the waterline, the keel, uh, drew about 28 feet. These were beautiful ships, and these were modern for the time after the Civil War. And if you can see the blue, this was the first class passengers, as I indicated. And if you can think about maybe the movie Titanic, which had the same type of disposition of first class and steerage passengers, you get the idea with regard to the, the new Trans-Pacific steamer service from Hong Kong. There was a lot of berths up forward for the steerage class passengers. And of course, the staterooms, the restrooms, facilities on the top side deck uh, was also the social hall for the uh, first class passengers. After the Pacific crossings uh, for everyone's history tonight, where did the over 40,000 Chinese immigrants from Guangdong take their first steps? And almost 100% of the Chinese immigration from Guangdong province were from two districts, which are very, very important today for China's economy, as well as creativity of the people and industry. That includes the Siap uh, provinces, which were on the uh, southwest side of the Pearl River. And that includes the uh, Sunhui, Taishan, Kaiping, and Enping uh, districts inside of Guangdong. And then you have the Samyap, which is the urban areas around Guangzhou, uh, including the Namhoi, Punyu, and Suyi uh, prop, uh, districts around the city. And all of the immigrants had to come from one of these two areas, and they had to make passage with, however they could, uh, either through the Pearl River to Hong Kong or from Taishan 
down into the water to get to Hong Kong. There they had to clear uh, British customs since it was a British Crown Colony port in the 1868 timeframe, as well as US regulations in order to get immigration passage on board a US flag vessel. So these 40,000 Chinese immigrant crossings on these beautiful steamers, the ones in the book, the ones I've studied had over 100 round trip voyages. They didn't have United Airlines. They didn't have China Air. They didn't have the opportunity to go quickly. They had to endure an average 33 day transit with a top speed of approximately 10 miles per hour. And they departed Hong Kong, but they also were coal fired vessels and they had to stop in Yokohama in order to get enough coal to make it across the Pacific. Their voyage was going to be 7,000 nautical miles at 216 nautical miles per day. And they also had to endure the weather. The Southwest monsoon season, and that's what we're in right now, is from March through September, which includes the tropical cyclones that curve up into Hong Kong and Taiwan and the uh, South China Sea. And then in the, in the uh, winter time, you have the uh, Northeast monsoon seasons from September to March. This is an actual uh, graphic that shows the routes of this Pacific Mail Steamship Company that shows the Hong Kong departure to Yokohama and also across to San Francisco. The other lines you can see was the Pacific Mail Steamship Company before the Panama Canal had the actual contract to carry passengers from New York to the Panama Canal and then up through Central America, Mexico, stopping in San Francisco and then heading up to Canada and also Seattle. So where did they take their first steps in America? It's very curious that this evening's presentation occurs when the San Francisco Giants are playing at AT&T Park along China Basin. And after the presentation tonight, if you're lucky, maybe you'll see one of the giant hitters hit a long home run over the left field pavilion and bounce about 40 yards and come to rest right where you see that that particular circle there. That is the focal point. This is not Angel Island. This is the location where all of these Guangdong sojourners made their first steps in San Francisco, in California, off of these steamers. This is what it looks like today. This is what it looked like then. And for those who have been to San Francisco, at t Park is right on China Basin and they called it China Basin for a reason because this is where the steamers came from China and also from Japan. And you can see another colored area there where the pier was for the Pacific Mail steamships where everyone came off, took their first steps and after usually three to four years, after they've had success mining through commerce in Chinatown, building the grottos in Napa Valley, working on the mines in California. This is where they returned, got on the ships and returned to Guangzhou for their better life in their district. During my studies, I, I really am very excited about the discovery and the role of the Pacific Mail Steamship because I found that uh, the Chinese American community did not have a similar Ellis Island type of historical reference point. And some people term Angel Island, one of those immigration sites and indeed it is, but this is the first site. This is the site along the San, San Francisco waterfront where the, the free contract Chinese immigration occurred, where this over 40,000 on the Pacific Mail steamships and over 100,000 of the Guangdong immigrants came to Gold Mountain, to San Francisco. You can see in this picture here, uh, former mayor, uh, the late Mayor Lee, 
there as well as other members of the San Francisco City Council honoring this particular place and recognizing the importance of it in San Francisco. My research uncovered the names of the ships, the names of the captains, and the numbers of Chinese immigrants that came across and made their Pacific crossing. And this is, this is some history I'm very honored to pass to all of you and to Esther and Wilson Lee, uh, honored to actually present this tonight, but this is part of the heritage, exactly what the Chinese American Heritage Foundation is all about. Show the ships that they came to America on, show the captains that were entrusted with their lives. Show what that immigration's promise was during this particular time frame before Chinese exclusion in 1882. This is a, a busy chart with a lot of detail, but from left down to the lower corner, my research noted the Chinese consolidated benevolent associations that were formed in California and in Guangdong in the early years after the California gold rush. They, they were the benevolent associations that took care of people from their districts. Uh, the Taishan population was the greatest mm -hmm. And uh, these particular, the Ning Yung, uh, and these particular benevolent associations are, are still serving uh, the community uh, in this day and age in San Francisco. But you can see from the CE and the Sanyi districts, you can see the, the labor and the, and the trades that people were involved with uh, right from my research, farmers, fishermen, craftsmen, railroad labor that came across to Hong Kong, as well as the merchants and the artisans. Uh, these were the, the wild geese, as they called them. And this particular chart is in the book. Uh, and I provided it to uh, uh, Esther and the Chinese American Heritage Foundation because it is history. And you're able to account for where people came from, what ships they came on, and looking at how long it took, and looking at the numbers of people based on the San Francisco Customs House that arrived in San Francisco and departed San Francisco during my years of this, this study. I tried to, to get primary source representative research to tell this history because it's very important. Uh, I went to UCLA. My history professor was Dr. Robert Dalek who is a presidential historian. He taught his students to try to find the original context of history, find the original uh, manuscripts to tell the story. And that's what I've done uh, in, the, in the Voices narrative. And you can see from my research, I was able to find the actual Guangdong province from woodcuts that showed the actual housing, the people that were part of the immigrant experience uh, praying to their joss before they departed, praying for a safe passage to America, looking at the docks in Guangzhou before they went down the Pearl River, and also looking at some of the transactions that occurred between labor contractors to get the promissory note or at least get the money up front so that they were able to purchase their tickets on board the vessels so they can have a place to sleep, that they were fed on board the ships during their transit across the Pacific. As I mentioned, British Crown Colony had the responsibility to clear in Hong Kong, but the United States, because of President Lincoln's leadership and the anti-slavery spirit in the United States, the Congress passed a law in 1862, which talked about the passage of people of their own free will. And with with the uh, what they called the coolie trade, leaving Macau to Portugal and the Spanish colonies, the guano pits in Peru, the sugarcane uh, trade, where they needed labor and they came out of uh, Macau in general. The United States passed a law to prohibit what they termed coolie trade in order for 
the people and the captains on board the ships to have documentation that certified that the people departing Guangdong were departing for their labor contract and of their own free will. It was also dangerous when you transit the South China Sea and the Pacific, and as I mentioned, the monsoon season, but these were coal fired ships. And of the four ships that were discussed during the, the uh, presentation this evening, you remember the Great Republic, the China, the America, and the Japan, 50% of them or two of them had these extraordinary coal fires and they, they were all wooden ships and people were killed. And uh, my book talks about the final tragic story of the SS Japan, but her sister ship in Yokohama also had a coal fire at the harbor in Yokohama. Fewer people died, but it was still a great tragedy. So this was a danger. This was a, not just the weather, not just the sea, but also the peril of fire and not being able to escape. And not being able to escape is something that they were probably thoughtful of because they were down in the forward part of the ship, six decks down, and they all lived on these uh, stationary bunks that were put forward three high so that the ent entire passenger uh, group could be uh, properly berthed as well as uh, have their phased feeding up on the weather decks where they would be able to eat their complement of rice and have their, their native foods also be part of the uh, lunchtime hour. But this is what they had to endure, if you can imagine this. And again, you're going about 10 miles an hour. Uh, if Depending on the wind and depending on the sea, you would be rocking and rolling. It's warm down there. The air circulation wasn't that great, but they would endure the passage, that 33-day passage between Hong Kong and San Francisco. During their meal hours, they had meal tickets that were managed by the crew of the ship. And most of the passengers were part of labor groups. So they had leaders within these labor groups that would have uh, their, their time to actually eat and provide their meal ticket before they were allowed to go up uh, to the meal deck to get their, get their ration. And what a ration it was. These were all the mid, midday lunch. Uh, this is a, a steerage lunch uh, on board the sister, one of the sister ships of uh, the Pacific Mail steamship uh, group uh, called the Alaska. Uh, you can see the different uh, colors of, of clothing that the, uh, the labor uh, personnel were wearing. You could see the actual uh, large uh, delivery of the basket full of rice. You could see the hot water. They were able to uh, use the hot water to basically uh, put their vegetables. Their, they loved abalone. They liked uh, their different seafood, their native foods, you know, from uh, Guangzhou and uh, Guangdong that they were able to bring with them. They had some of that also on the ship. But you could see that if you were going to mess or ration feed 1,200 people, it would take uh, a good period of time to do so. But the good news is they were not in their birthing areas. They had the uh, air uh, circulating inside so that they had some, some reasonably good uh, conditions to eat their food. After their uh, crossing, they arrived in San Francisco and in the research, I always tried to find uh, color photographs that would be able to communicate to the reader as well as communicate to the, the, the folks that are receiving the, the overview of the voyages, what districts they came from and, and looking at how they uh, wore their, their different labor attire, uh, which would help with regard to their, their messing as well as their uh, exit through their customs when they got to San Francisco. All the ships uh, had to go through customs and the customs officials, both the uh, San Francisco customs, the San Francisco police uh, were inspecting for uh, contraband. 
and uh, before they could go to their their destination in uh, Chinatown. There was also women, and this this was also a, a big and exciting uh, port arrival for the laborers that were there to basically uh, see to it that the women that were transported got to uh, their Teamster wagon and got into their, uh, they were safely uh, transported from the dockside up to uh, their, their quarters up in Chinatown. But since there were so few women that uh, transited over in a very male dominated uh, waterfront as well as uh, Chinatown, uh, it caused uh, quite a stir for those that were in San Francisco during this time frame coming off of these uh, steamers. These steamers also uh, were able to bring across some very important dignitaries. And in this particular case, this is the sister ship, the Pacific Mail Steamship China. And this is a very famous ship because this is the ship that brought from China at the uh, conclusion of the uh, Qing Dynasty with uh, uh, Prince Kong after the Taiping Rebellion. This, this was the uh, very important ambassador that was able to resign his position. He was Abraham Lincoln's China ambassador and he requested permission to, in order to represent China fairly against the British, against the Russians, people that were taking advantage of China with regard to trade. So he was able to get the approval from the US State Department to become the Chinese representative with Prince Kong's representative, Sun Tajin, and they were able to come across on the SS China to San Francisco in March of 1868. This is the first delegation that was able to make the Pacific Mail Steamship Transit across the Pacific and bring the Chinese delegation to San Francisco. This is the first delegation that represented China's interests the Qing Dynasty interest with Prince Kong in the United States. And this is their arrival. There's a snapshot up on the right top that shows the actual dock area with some of the wagons to give you a, a feel of the arrival conditions in San Francisco. Also the Pacific Mail Steamship. This is critically important after the, the vision of Abraham Lincoln, the fact that we were able to have scheduled steamship service between China and the United States with these four significant steamers, the Great Republic, China, Japan, and the America. But again, the China is the one that brought the Burlingame delegation with Sun Tajin to the United States for the Burlingame Treaty. And the SS China lasted for a few years and continued her service. But in 1880, uh, her service, especially with the technology going from side wheel steamer to also to the, uh, the screw, uh, iron screw uh, technology. These side wheel steamers were too slow. They burnt too much coal and they were dangerous because they were all wooden. So it went to the iron, iron ships as well as uh, stern sc screw steam technology. And this is a picture of the China being broken up across from the Golden Gate area in Tiburon, Belvedere where they broke up, not too far from Angel Island, where they broke up the, the steamers there for salvage. In my story, the, vi the voices from the bottom of the South China Sea uh, was, a, was a real tragedy for the Chinese. Uh, they had 537 total passengers on board the ship. She left San Francisco on a beautiful November day. The people were going home. They had spent three to four years in California. They had their gold, some of it around their necks. They had it in their cargo, but they were leaving to head back home to Guangdong after a very successful time. They had paid their labor debts to the Pacific Mail Steamship Company, as well as the uh, labor sponsors. And the residents of this particular story in, uh, for our Chinese leaders in the United States, in particular, uh, Ambassador Gary Locke, who was a, uh, I think he was uh, from uh, Kaiping uh, area when he was our US ambassador there and, and our Commerce Secretary uh, during the occasions when he visited 
he uh, was very well received uh, because of his his uh, ancestors, and the, he's a descendant of the of the of the original Guangdong uh, sojourners. Also, uh, Judy Chu, uh, representative uh, down in Monterey Park, she is also uh, Guangdong province, uh, and she has her uh, descendants that came from uh, this particular. Her ancestors came from this particular province, and then finally, Mayor Lee. I never had a chance to meet him. I uh, wish I would have, but uh, Mayor Lee was also uh, has ancestry in Guangdong province. But this this ship, a beautiful ship, all the folks were up forward. She was about 12 hours from Hong Kong, almost home. So she's done 32 days and she had to load coal up in Yokohama and it rained up there and the coal got wet. And when they loaded the coal, they, had the, they should have dried it, but they did not. And what happened is the coal spontaneously combusted about 10 minutes before midnight in December 17th, 1874. And in 45 minutes, it started with smoke. They called out fire. They got 20 streams of water going. The, the Chinese uh, steerage passengers were all forward. And as you can see, they couldn't get to the lifeboats aft. And in 45 minutes, the ship burned to the waterline. People were jumping off into the night. The wind was blowing almost 35 knots and they were on a downhill run it's a northeast monsoon and it's dark, very dark. And they're 20 miles off of uh, China, off of uh, Fujian uh, province. They did get six lifeboats out and 137 people did survive, but 400 regretfully perished. And my research has uncovered the final resting places of two pieces of the ship, which sunk to the bottom of the South China Sea. So our final resting place of the SS Japan, which carried some of those 40,000 Chinese immigrants back and forth from Guangdong to San Francisco on her last voyage, she was lost. 406 souls lost. She was, a, it's the largest loss of Chinese American immigrants in history. Largest side wheel steamer in the world when lost. And the wreckage is about 20 miles off of China's coast in the contiguous zone. And here's a, here's a letter, little better picture for you that, that shows where the two wreck sites are. It's in about 140 feet of water. I've got the last records of where the ship physically was. In addition to the cargo, there was about $370,000 in silver trade dollars and about $8,200 in gold. And they did have a salvage and they did recover most of the silver. They never found the gold. So the estimated treasure value is approximately $250 million in today's dollars. But the real treasure value is the fact that we've located the final resting place of the souls that were heading back home to China. And as I think many would know on the call that in Tao and Confucian tradition, your soul cannot be released to heaven until you've had and arrived at your resting place in China. And this is one of the, the, the most fulfilling things about writing this book is the fact that I was able to locate the final resting place and that the six companies, the benevolent associations had that arrangement with the Pacific Mail Steamship that they would not allow the transit of the Chinese immigrants unless they guaranteed they would bring their bodies and their bones back home to China. So ladies and gentlemen, here's the final resting place of those 400 souls and also the wreckage of the Pacific Mail steamship about 120 miles east of Hong Kong, about 20 miles south of uh, Shantou. I know there's a couple uh, folks tonight that uh, have the surname Ng, and uh, for the last five years, I've been trying to locate a survivor or a survivor family from this particular tragedy. And these are the only names I have. I have uh, 
uh, Sing Ng, I have Sing Cha, I have Sing Leong, and Loi Wong. So those are the four names I have. Uh, they're probably, these were the actual uh, Chinese crew members that uh, signed up for the, the Pacific Mail Steamship. They did have Chinese crews on board that were responsible for the uh, stewardship, the meal service, the engineering, uh, the movement of uh, cargo, coal, but they were very good sailors uh, to support the Pacific Mail Steamship. But if you know of somebody in your family that may have been part of this during this time, uh, I'm the author, and I'm I'm trying to find I'm trying to find them. I have located the great 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 grandson of the captain of the ship in New York and also New Hampshire. So in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, tonight, it's ball game, San Francisco, that big home run, it's gonna bounce and it's gonna come to rest at the location where almost 100,000 Chinese immigrants took their first steps after their Pacific crossings, after all the dangers. And these were people that were very determined. They had a lot of strength, they had stamina, they survived. And for, we've always had uh, curiosity about uh, these four ships. And, and as I mentioned, the Japan is off of China. The America uh, was wrecked and burnt in Yokohama. The Great Republic, the wreckage is in the Columbia River by Astoria. It's still there, an active wreck. Uh, divers have been to the wreck of the Great Republic. And the only remnant the only artifact of these ships that's still afloat, still above water, is the SS China in Tiburon. In fact, this is the actual picture of the China cabin in Tiburon next to Angel Island. So if you go to Angel Island and you want to see a remnant that brought the Burlingame delegation where Sun Tajian probably roamed around, it's right there and it's very famous. And this particular ship, the SS China, brought all those immigrants and brought the Burlingame delegation to California. So in conclusion, this, this history is very, very important, I think, uh, for the Chinese American heritage, recognition of the heritage. I think it provides the uh, Chinese American community in the United States with an example of actual ships and actual captains and actual people that you can trace from Guangdong during this period before 1882, because there's a lot of history there as well. But a lot of 1882 began on the docks of the Pacific Mail Steamship Company. But this, this is very important and I really appreciate the honor this evening to present this story to you all. And I really thank Ken and I thank you also uh, Esther and Wilson and all the Chinese American Heritage Foundation members for allowing me to present this story to you this evening. Thank you. Well, thank you, Captain Bob. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, wow. You know, my, my, my own grandfather, he came over in the early 1900s. And, 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 you know, he did talk about how long the journey was. But, uh, but he sailed on a, uh, a newer steam, steamer. So I don't think it was 33 days. But we have some questions for you, if you don't mind uh, taking them. Um, the first question is, so how long did it take you to do this research to finish the book? That's a great question. Uh, it took, it took uh, four and a half years uh, to do the research. And, and the genesis of the research, uh, I was on President Bush uh, and the vice president's staff when Hu Jintao was doing a state visit. And I had a discussion with the political officer whose family was from Fujian. And the whole essence of the discussion was about the US-China trade. How did it all begin? What ships were involved with it? Which started me off on a, on a quest. And I found one little footnote about the loss of a ship and a US Navy uh, piracy protection mission where they were recovering the silver. And that started me from that four and a half years of uh, research to finding a you know, getting it uh, readers and getting it published and 
getting all the right uh, illustrations to go with the book to help. It, it is new history. It has made history in China and also in, um, in the United States. And that's what I wanted to try to achieve. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, let me see. We have another question. And they asked, so how hard was it to find the research? Uh, that's another great question. I, I had to go to, uh, I lived in Washington, D.C. for 16 years. So I was at the right place at the right time to do National Archive research. Because I'm a naval officer, I was able to go to the, naval, the National Archives about the Navy. And in the, in the names of the ships, I was able to find the physical location of the wreck site. And I was able to also uh, reach out to Professor Dalek to sponsor my research at the Huntington, uh, the Huntington in uh, California, as well as uh, uh, just by continuing to, it's like, it's like a mosaic, really. It was, uh, you find a little piece here and a little piece there, but for, for, for the students that want to know more about this particular uh, trade and I used to work, I talked with May Nye who wrote uh, The Lucky Ones. And she said, Bob, you've got a totally different uh, research angle here because I focus on the diplomatic cables, the State Department cables, which were very uh, rich in telling the story about the recovery of the wreck, the admiralty laws, the treasure recovery and so forth. So it, it was, and I'd wake up at two in the morning and I'd, I'd have a, uh, eight by 14 legal pad and I just I just start writing when it all kind of came together so be careful what you wish for out there <laughs> all right so we have another question um this is so interesting uh, how does coal spontaneously combust and how long did it take to find the wreckage yeah th those are those are two great questions uh the coal when it's down in a uh in a bunker will get warm and it emits a gas. And because you don't have uh, ventilation there in an enclosed space, it continues to, it, it's, it's uh, bituminous coal. It, it gets warmer and warmer and warmer in a non-ventilated space like a bunker on board this ship. And as it's getting warmer, it's emitting gas. So when it gets warmer, and the gas ignites, it ignites the coal. It feeds on each other. And down in this bunker, you never, they never saw flames at first. They just, they just saw the, uh, the smoke. How long did it take to find a wreckage? Uh, it took me, I had three Eureka moments. One of them was the, uh, the naval logs of the piracy recovery where I had to take the British uh, and English names of the navigation points reverse navigate from Chanteau out to the wreck site. And I found a treasure map, which had the specific spot and it married up with the navigation details. And then the final one was uh, the uh, University of California at Santa Barbara had a 1880s picture album, which had all the Americans living in China. And that's where I found the captain, his wife, the daughters, and a little bit more of the story about the wreckage itself. Right. So I guess this is a follow-up to that. It's, so if all the gold couldn't be found, do you think someone has stolen the gold? Uh, that's a very interesting question because the last time that they had salvers down on the wreck was really uh, in history, 1877. And they were able to pull out the, uh, the silver from the treasure tank, which had all these brand new trade dollars in the treasure tank. And the gold itself was in a safe and it broke off. There's two pieces of the, two pieces of the ship. The, the gold is in the purser's office, which broke off when the side wheel broke off from the ship due to the weight of the water as the, as the burning uh, caused the, the, the ship's hull to basically burn to the water line and all the water came in and broke the ship up. So the gold has not been found. It's in a safe. Uh, it could have been found. I don't think it was stolen. I don't think people knew. I do know that probably the fishermen out there 
uh, have uh, hung up their nets uh, on this particular wreck for, for decades. But uh, I would still like to try to get back to the wreck site. That's fantastic. And the next question we have is, so what inspired you to research this topic and the ship fire? And why do you think it's important for Americans to know? What inspired me was the US-China trade, the importance of our relationships uh, between our two peoples. Also, it's a people to people story. And I'm a sailor, I'm a captain. I've sailed on the South China Sea. I know how, how terrible it is for a captain uh, to endure weather and to see what they accomplished as mariners back in the 1860s and 70s with their technology uh, was just something that was interesting to me. I also think that uh, I'm a historian and uh, I'm, I have a national security uh, background, but I, I love history. So I wanted to honor my, my professor at UCLA by writing a history book. So that inspired me to do it right. And it came at the right time in my life when this was a very interesting topic uh, in the Bush administration, still is, is still front and center for our world, is the relationship between the United States and China. We had lots of tragedy after the uh, Pacific Mail steamship dock riots, the racism. You had all the different uh, aspects of uh, regulations against Chinese. You had the road to 1882, uh, which started really with this particular trade. So I wanted to learn about that a little bit more and uh, peel back the onion a little bit more to understand the, the history and context. So I'm still inspired by it. So while you're still inspired, I'll ask you this next question. So uh, any plans to work on another book? Well, uh, the answer from my wife is no, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I, ha I, have, I have crafted uh, two screenplays. Uh, there, there, is a, there is a possibility that a documentary will be included about the uh, SS Japan um, and I'm, I'm hoping uh, that it will come out. It'll be a small piece of the story. And I'm also trying to get, uh, I've, ha I've actually had uh, two studios and one director look at the, the story as a Titanic of the East with the focus of the women and the focus of the working uh, people that came between China and the United States. And I've got uh, a couple of heroines on board the ship, actually, you know, from the story. The American stewardess, her name was Nellie Noble. That's a great, that's a great name and a great story. And I also have the captain, but I also have the uh, pictures of the of the women that actually came across. And I've I've written a, a screenplay uh, story that has been registered with the Writers Guild of America West. So that those are my those are my book plans uh, at the moment there, Ken. Wow. Well, how interesting is that? Looking forward to that, uh, your, your, your screenplay uh, showing up on the big screen there. And we have one more question here. So Ian mentioned that there were some passengers who, who jumped overboard. Are there any accounts of their ordeal that you uncovered during your research? Yes, I did. Um, there was a few more slides I could have added, but because of the time, uh, looking at the lifeboats, looking at the heroism, what they did uh, going from the morning was just absolutely tragic for the captain. You know, he's lost his ship and uh, the crew and some of the survivors uh, had, to, had to row themselves into Hong Kong and uh, many had to be picked up by junks and also by a, uh, a British steamer to get to Chanteau. Uh, it, it was very tragic. There was just uh, as they say in this, in using sailor language, flotsam and jetsam, just debris uh, all over, pieces of the ship, burnt cargo, a montrass for a religious service that was part of the actual debris field, dead bodies. You know, if you remember the Titanic, it had all the people that were frozen. You know, here you had people that had drowned. And there were many people that had, if you saw their birthing compartment, they had a very difficult time because of the smoke inhalation. They couldn't get to the top deck. Many of them jumped over the side in the middle of the night. You know, they had their, uh, their gold uh, necklaces on and they sunk when they got uh, down to the water itself. 
again, the wind was blowing 35 knots. The ship was fully in flame, fully engulfed in flame. Uh, it was the monsoon season and the screams in the night could not be heard. It's 20 miles out at sea. So it was very much a tragedy when the next morning came. Uh, I write about it in detail in the book and what all the lifeboats did and the response when they got to Hong Kong and how they came back out to uh, try to find some survivors. And they found, a, they found some uh, folks obviously uh, on the British steamer uh, and they finally got to Hong Kong as well. But then the captain and the crew had to endure a, a trial, an admiralty trial inquest about uh, culpability and they found the uh, chief engineer guilty. That's a great question. There's lots here to the story. It's very tragic, uh, tragic uh, but the voices that you hear are their voices. And that's what I wanted to try to write about. I think, I think you, your work is amazing. So can you please tell us how we can get a copy of your book? And if one wanted to get an autographed copy, how would they would go about doing that? Well, thank you, Ken. Uh, for an autographed copy, you can uh, email Esther or, or, or Wilson, uh, you know, or yourself, uh, Ken, if you'd like, uh, and just give me the address and what inscription you wanted uh, on it as well. Uh, the, book, the book cost with the, with the shipping uh, $24. Uh, so if you want to just, uh, you know, I can, I can send you and you can send me, uh, th that would be fine. If you want to order it online, um, it's, uh, it's on the website. It's www.southchinavoices.com. www.southchinavoices.com. And you can purchase a copy. It's on Barnes and Noble. It's on uh, uh, eBay. Uh, and Amazon. Amazon will deliver uh, right to you. Okay, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. Do you have time for just one more question? Yes, yes, please. Okay, so this last question is, please talk about the Chinese who first landed in China Basin. Uh, what criteria was used to send those portions of the immigrants to Angel Island for detention and clearance? Okay. Yeah, uh, that's a very important question. Uh, why did they land there? Uh, the, the first part of the 1849 gold rush period with the Argonaut uh, vessels, the clipper ships that came to San Francisco, um, they, they landed at that part, that area of, of uh, San Francisco. And when they looked at the actual uh, location where they could put a a steamer pier in because a lot of the people coming to the gold rush had to go through Panama. Panama looms large before a canal, but the steamship company since 1848, uh, the Pacific Mail Steamship Company, had those routes from Panama up to California, and they also had it from New York to Panama. So they had to have a pier when they got to San Francisco, and they put that pier there. And the China Basin name is because of the scheduled China service of these four large steamships of the world. So this is the Pacific Mail Steamship Pier. Uh, I think on one of the slides, I think with Ambassador Burlingame, you could see the, the marquee on the front of the pier. It said uh, Pacific Mail Steamship Service to China and Japan. So they had their own, they had their own, uh, it's like a train station. They had their own gates to go aboard the China cruise and if they had their Pacific Mail Steamship Pier to Panama uh, and to New York via Panama on the left-hand side. So it was a, it's a designated pier area and it became the China Basin because that's where all the Chinese immigrants uh, came. Now Angel Island, uh, during the 1882 Exclusion Act, and then you get into the, the specific uh, people that would be able to come, you get into Paper Sons, you get into uh, the U.S. Immigration Service, I think Angel Island was established in 1910. So it, it's, it's a couple decades after exclusion, uh, but it was put there so that people would be uh, recorded uh, in terms of their arrival. Uh, Ken's right uh, with the uh, uh, new modern ships that came over from the Pacific Mail uh, that had screw steam. You know, it, they continued through the 1880s to the early 1900s. They were named the city of Peking, uh, the, the uh, Manchuria, and these Pacific Mail steamships would, would come into the same piers, but they also brought the Chinese and they were taken then over to Angel Island. 
And uh, the Pacific Mail became the dollar line in later years until the, uh, the, the 1882 Exclusion Act was uh, rescinded uh, by the Magnuson Act of 1943. That's fantastic. Well, Captain Bob, I think uh, I want to thank you on behalf of the uh, Chinese American Heritage Foundation. And as a sea captain, sir, you are right on time. Thank you very <laughs> much. And I hope to uh, get, uh, I'll be uh, ordering a copy of a book. Uh, I'm going to be pouring over it the next few days. Thank you very much. And again, for our participants, thank you very much for joining the uh, AAPI Talks 2021. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you very much, Ken. Fair winds and following seas to everyone. Thank you. Ha, <laughs> ha,